So this is the unit we're working on today. It's a, a Lennox a GCS 16 series. It's a 10 ton unit. Uh, it's a 2002. We actually installed this. And uh, I have a twin of it up there on, in front. And what had happened was is the ignition module on the unit up front uh, was dead. And this one, the draft motor was dead. So I robbed the ignition module out of this one and put it in the, the front unit to get that running. And today we're going to be replacing the draft and ignition module. I already put the, the new ignition module in there. Really simple, two screws, plug and plug. Um, but what I wanted to show you is there's actually nothing wrong with this draft. Uh, there's nothing wrong with the motor itself on this draft motor. It's a squirrel cage that's disintegrated. I don't know if you can see it in there. We'll, we'll get a better look when we pull it out, but you can see it's all cockeyed in there. All right, so now this is an older Lennox, so what they use is a centrifugal switch in the motor as a safety. Basically, if this motor isn't running, we don't want this unit to fire because that, mo that motor creates a draft and basically sucks the flame up all these heat exchanger tubes, okay? So the newer units have a vacuum switch, uh, or most newer units have a vacuum switch, which they'll have like a little, a little bob fitting here and go to a vacuum switch, and that's actually sensing the airflow. So even if this motor was good, but the, the uh, scroll cage disintegrated, the unit wouldn't fire. Um, in this case here, we have a centrifugal switch. So as long as this motor is running fast enough for that centrifugal switch to close, this unit's gonna fire, barring there's nothing else wrong. Um, so basically, what what ha what'll happen is when those flames light, okay, the flame will do what's called roll out. So it has no draft to suck the flame into those tubes. So the flame will actually shoot out this way. It'll rise, and that's what this switch is here for. So there he is. Is that the the flame will roll out? It'll touch this switch and it'll shut the unit off. You see, it's a manual reset. Okay, so and it does work unless there's anything wrong with this, and you end up with a giant flame everywhere right next to the gas valve. Bad thing. So the way this works is, um, you know, you, you call for heating downstairs. Your heating signal comes up to a relay that's in the main electrical panel over there. It then comes into to this section um, in two ways. It comes in as 208 volt from that relay out to start your motor, and it also sends a 24 volt signal. That 24 volt signal goes th through all your safety. So it's going to go through this switch here. It's going to go through the centrifugal switch, and it's also going to go through both of your limits. I know this heat exchanger doesn't look that great, but it is solid. Um, we have a limit mounted high on the heat exchanger, and we have a secondary limit mounted, I'm sorry, we have a primary limit mounted low down there, and we have a secondary limit mounted high. Now those are three wire um, limits. They can also control your fan. If you have your fan on set to auto on the thermostat, this heat exchanger will heat up first. It'll trigger one. It'll trigger one of those, and then your fan will turn on. So we don't get that blast of cold air. So that 24 volt signal, that, yeah, excuse me, then travels back to your ignition module, which is basically your brain box with this power. Then from here, it's going to energize your gas valve and your spark ignite. It's going to ignite through this igniter. The flame will light this tube, and I don't know if you can see how they're bolted in. There's a little gap between each one, with the, and that'll hold a small flame. So the flame will start there, it'll travel right across, and where this wire goes in, right there, that's your flame sensor. So that'll get warm, and that'll sense your flame. This will be, it, it does it by, um, Rectification, basically it heats that up, it chops the voltage, it's kind of complicated, but either way, basically that senses the flame, this knows that the flame has traveled all the way across, everything is lit, and it continues to work fine. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is just jump out the thermostat up here, and uh, we'll get this sucker to light, and I'll show you what a rollout looks like. We're only going to do it for like two seconds, um, you know, because I don't want it to uh, roll out too far here. Okay, let's see what a rollout looks like. Gotta give it a second for that uh, thermostat to catch up. There's the draft motor. It's not moving any air, but it's gonna try to fire. See the 
your flame roll out. You saw that flame pop right out and hit the bottom here. That's because that draft motor isn't sucking the air in. So we're going to put a new draft motor in there and you're going to see once I light it up again, you're going to see it get sucked right into a cone uh, on those tubes. good no now I know a lot of you are gonna say well why don't you just take the squirrel cage off and give him a new squirrel cage well the problem with that is this is never gonna come off there, there, there's no way the heat um, that this thing goes through the, this the, the screws in here they, and they uh, look like torques they're just rotted in there. There's no way. I mean, you can sit there and try, but it's more cost effective just to give them a whole new unit. I mean, the rest of it looks like shit, too. Um, you know, it's more cost effective just to give them a whole new draft motor, because you know, as soon as you change this and get this running, your motor's going to die, and you're right back in the same situation. So you're better off just getting the whole assembly and uh, just replacing it. So i got to reuse this piece here as to come off and mount to the new uh, draft motor, and then we can get it all in place. pre-drilled holes in it from um, from having it in one direction but they're already pierced through the other side that's not a big thing
think they only strip you like a tiny, tiny little bit on this, but those are stripped enough, surprisingly, usually you have to strip off more. Necessary, but it's just the force I have it for me. I always do it. Triple switch uh, guys here. Tell me out. They just get plugged in right here. set you up at uh, the burner rack again and uh, we'll start it up. Now I do have the, uh, the the supply out of the unit. I have it blocked off with the panel. Um, the reason being is this is his first start up of the season. If it smokes I don't want any of that crap going into the building otherwise you end up meeting the fire department real quick and they're usually pretty pissed. Okay, so here we go. Power on. Plenty of air now. There's a pre-purge delay on it. So this has a certain, uh, let's see how long it is. Usually it says pre-purge in a per 30 seconds, so a minute. There it is there. See that flame traveled all the way up. Now you, you now you can see the nice cones and being sucked right through there. We get you in a little bit further. Okay, I'm gonna come around to this side here. See, I have it blanked off. This heat exchanger here is heating up now. It's going to heat up to a certain point, and then that blow is going to turn on. In the meantime, there's a very good chance that it'll smoke and burn off whatever's been collected on that heat exchanger for the spring and the summer. So that's why 
this, this panel that covers this, you can shove in and block off the supply down into the building. Belt problem too. I didn't check. Um, let me check the belt. <laughs> okay, well here's your problem. They they do their own maintenance here, and um, that's a good thing and a bad thing, I guess. But in this case, it's a bad thing. This belt is tighter. I mean, I I have to push to even make this thing turn. I have to push pretty hard to get it. Look at, look at how much of a turn I get out of that. Plus that wheel is filthy. Look at how filthy that wheel is. Look at that. Ah, damn it. I know they're not, I'm gonna call them. I mean, I can get the belt going, no problem. I'm just gonna loosen up the, the, the motor plate. And just as a quick tip, let me put this on the tripod down again here. You see our motors like this, and you can see it here. This panel is independent of everything else. The only thing that's holding it are these two little bars here, right? So if you tighten this belt too tight, you're gonna cant the whole thing in, and your pulley is gonna be pointing down at an angle, which you can actually see is the case here. I'm closer at the top than at the bottom. What you wanna do is just, when you tighten a belt, do yourself a favor, takes two seconds, get a tape measure and just make sure at the bottom and top match that this plate is vertical. It saves you a hell of a lot of hassles, you're not going to throw as many belts, you're not going to beat the crap out of that motor pulley as much. Um, yeah, that blow, the, the blower wheel, I can almost guarantee you they're not going to want me to take it out and clean it. Um, but I'll call them and in C. Um, but that belt, I gotta, I gotta loosen that belt. Well, we're tensioned correctly now. This is vertical to the post. Let's turn it on, manually pressing the contact. Everything seems okay. We're running in the correct direction. We got a little bit of a jimmy to it, a little bit of a shake. But the uh, customer doesn't want me to change it, or doesn't want me to clean it, so. You know, you can only suggest these things. If they don't want to pay for it, they don't want to pay for it. The customer's always right, so it's gonna be a problem down the road. But for now, we're up and running. I'll make sure it fires up again, do another burn up, but otherwise, this job is done. It just one quick thing I wanted to address um, for everybody that watches uh, people like me in service companies in their videos. In a lot of comments, sometimes you get uh, people asking, well, why didn't you do this? Why didn't you do that? You should have done this. You should have done that. Well, a lot of times you don't know what we're limited to. Um, you know, so, some things our customers just won't pay for or they can't. Uh, a lot of times um, they'll have service contracts with somebody else with like a PM contract and the only do is change filters. Um, a lot of times, especially in commercial uh, companies and, and restaurants and stuff, that restaurant has a budget for uh, unit repair and unit replacement. And usually if you get a bill or a service work that exceeds X amount of money, usually anywhere between $500 and $1,000, that's considered capital expense and comes out of the corporate budget and not the actual store's budget. Uh, and that would require approval. If you were to just do the work that I know need, needs to be done, um, that, and we go to submit a bill and we don't have an approval PO for it, then that bill won't get paid. Um, you know, so a case of point is that blower, it, it needs to be cleaned. 
I know it needs to be clean. You know it needs to be clean. The customer knows it needs to be clean. Uh, the customer doesn't want to pay the extra money to get it clean, which is their decision, 100% their decision. Um, you know, it, and some of you out there may say, may be like, well, it's not going to take you that long to do. Why don't you just do it? Well, it's not something that I could bill him for because he said he didn't want it done. He didn't want the extra charge. So that would probably take me about an hour to rip everything apart, get it completely torn down and clean to the point where I would consider it clean, oil the grease back up and put it back in place. Now, that's an hour that my company is not getting paid for, yet they're still paying me. That is also an hour that I have to put off my next job for. Um, you know, you just, you, you can't, you can't do that. Companies have a huge overhead that people don't realize. Uh, not necessarily in commercial business, they do realize that because they have the same overhead. Um, probably, probably a little more, more prevalent in, um, in residential uh, work. You know, they'll ask you, why, well, why is your rate so high, or why is the markup so high, or I can buy that cheaper online. And you know what? Yeah, you probably can. But you know, we we have a, a company has expenses. The bigger the company, the bigger their expense. My company is not only paying my hourly salary, they're also paying my health insurance, they're paying workman's comp insurance, they're paying unemployment insurance, they're also paying liability insurance for all their workers, um, their commercial liability insurance, they're paying for this truck that I'm driving, they're paying for the gas for this truck, they're paying for the stock on this truck, they're paying for car insurance on this truck, So, it, and they're, they're paying for rent in uh, uh, whatever shop they have. Um, you know, they, there's a, there's a lot of expense going on there that you just, you don't realize. Um, you know, and us as a company, we're probably rate-wise, hourly rate-wise, charging our customers. We're probably below average. We're, we're pretty low. We make it up for in quantity of work. I mean, we're a relatively small company, but we have a lot of very, very large clients. Um, and the key to any of that is keeping your customers happy. You know, I can go into a job and rape and pillage with the rest of them, but, you know, if you go there and you tell your customer exactly what's up, say, you know, your unit's 15, 20 years old, it's time for a new one, um, I, I would make more money on repairing that unit month after month after month than replacing that unit. If they want to spend the money and go and replace it, perfectly fine. If they want to, they, if they want to decide, no, we can't do that right now. We just want to get it up and running. Perfectly fine. But you got to give them the options, and and you know let them know. Also, I you know prompt service. If a customer calls and has forty thousand dollars worth of food in the walk-in, they expect to be there pretty damn quick. Um, and you know pri prioritize your calls. A a, a walk-in cooler is going to take priority over a tiny region. Um, and you know, it's all customer service, keeping your customers happy. It's, you can't, I can't emphasize that more uh, uh, enough. And that, that's the way we have, that's why we have the accounts that we have. And you know, we've been in business as long as we have. And it's also one of the reasons why I'm still at this job. I mean, I could probably make more money some, some somewhere else uh, on an hourly basis, but you know what? I probably wouldn't like it because it's, it's not, I mean, it, not that they're not treating the customers right, but you know, it's, it's, it's no name business, it's no name customers, it's just one call after another after another. These customers I've had, I've been working, I've been working with them for 16 years. I know them, they know me, they trust me and I trust them. So, um, you know, that's, that's one of the reasons, just, just customer service. I mean, I can't, can't emphasize that enough. Just keep your customers happy and you'll have work year round. Um, and you know, that's the way we've built our business and continue to build our business. Uh, if you look at any of our trucks, none of our trucks are labeled. We do not have a single phone number or anything on the side of this truck. Uh, all of our all of our calls and most of our service work comes from word of mouth. Also, in restaurant businesses, um, it's very, people hop around a lot. So you, if you have a guy at one, say, restaurant chain or one restaurant, there's a good chance he's not going to stay there for life. Um, he'll leave and go someplace else. And if they like you, they'll bring you along. If they don't like you, then they'll drop you in a heartbeat. And what you, a lot of times has happened is, you know, 
they'll leave a restaurant and they'll bring us into another place and we'll get in the door there and start doing their service work. Now, if you, even if you hate the guy and you piss him off wherever he is, one day he changes and all of a sudden he's at one of your, your biggest accounts now, he's a big wig over there, now you're screwed because now he's going to want you out the door. So, I mean, keep your customers happy. There are customers out there that are assholes, but you know what? You got to smile and do what they want. Um, it's just a fact of life. So, you know, my rant's over right now. There's traffic everywhere here. This is always fun. I'm trying to get around all this from working in Massachusetts, right? A 90 degree turn on the highway. This works. traffic on to the next job actually next job we're going for is an ice machine and this ice machine is brand new uh, it was installed maybe a you know, month month and a half two months ago at most uh, we didn't install it uh, it's at one of our accounts but we didn't install it they had another company go install it because they were cheaper and um, notice that they're not calling them back to service so go there and uh, see what's going on with it see if we can get it up and running and back into shape so you guys get to skip the drive I get to drive it all right what we have here is a brand new Hoshitaki ice machine condensing unit remote condensing unit we didn't put this in this was put in by a different company which was fine but uh, I believe I just found the problem you can see This guy here was barely on there. You can see the arc on those tabs. So looks like it just heated up and uh, expanded the little female connector. No big deal. I'll just cut this off. I'll put a, a, another stake on it. I'll put a fork and I'll uh, screw it right into the screw. And that'll uh, I'll fix that problem. Okay, I know you can't see behind all those wires, but we got a uh, fork on there. We're bolted right into the contact. That ain't going anywhere. Uh, just for S and Gs, we'll check amperage. I just turn the power back on. Now the power. On these new Hoshizaki units, you can see this terminal block right here. That's what feeds my head downstairs. So the 208 plus the neutral comes up to this unit up here and then gets sent down to the head. Unlike the Manitoics where the head is completely independent from the power supply of the roof unit. They just have a signal line going between each other from the circuit boards. Um, the Hoshizaki's, the rooftop unit controls the power downstairs. So right now it's just uh, waiting for a delay. Um, it's doing its pump out and uh, and then this compressor will start up and we'll check uh, the running load amps. So let's skip the delay for you guys and I'll come back with the uh, amp readings. Okay, we just started this free cycle. Actually, all the valves, all the valves, uh, the frost valves and everything, I don't know if you can see them, but they're, they're up behind this. This where all the valves that control the flow of refrigerant for hot gas and frost. So, let's look at our nameplate here. Um, compressor, 10.1 running load. Our fans are going to 2.6. So 12.7 technically should be our total load on our main lines coming in and around 10 on our compressor. And I'll check the charge too. I just gotta grab my gauges from the truck, but we should be full of gas. So this here is the compressor, common wire. Now if we can read that, it says 9.3, 9.1, so we're pretty damn close there. Happy with that. And here's the main. And uh 13.1. So yeah, we, we're definitely definitely where we need to be amperage-wise. Um, and I'll just throw my gauges on here real quick, make sure my pressure's okay. They should, like I said, they should be. Uh, this unit's brand new, but we'll double check that before we go. But other than that, uh, we should be good. Just watch to drop a batch of ice, and uh, you know, this is one of those jobs where it takes you two seconds to do, and uh, 
you know, I'm probably going to give him a no charge invoice, even though we didn't put it in. Uh, somebody else is calling me.